I just uh, would like to reiterate that uh, unfortunately, in some senses, uh, last name, last name, council, um, but we're very fortunate to have Lisa Barreza to um, lecture tonight. Um, Lisa is a reader in psychosocial studies in the Department of Psychosocial Studies at Birkbeck, University of London, and is a psychotherapist in independent practice. She writes on motherhood and the maternal, on feminist theory, ethics, subjectivity, affect, temporality, and event. Lisa also runs the International Research Network for Mapping Maternal Subjectivities, Identities, and Ethics. Mamsi, as it's also known, organizes events and publishes a scholarly online journal, Studies in the Maternal, in collaboration with Sigal Spiegel at the University of Cambridge. Lisa is author of Maternal Encounters, The Ethics of Interruption, which was published in 2009 by Ravage, and which was a joint winner of the Feminist and Women's Studies Book Prize for Outstanding Feminist Scholarship in the same year. Her recent lectures have engaged with the work of key writers such as Lauren Berlant, Rosika Parker, and Rosie Pradotti. Her current research is on gender and temporality, particularly the temporalities of repetition, delay, endurance, staying, waiting, maintenance, and monotony, and their relations with contradictory and relentless temporalities of capitalism. And uh, not so long ago, she was also an uh, initiator of the experimental theater group Pura, uh, and uh, she may be able to say more about that later. Very interesting project she was running there. So please welcome Lisa Barretza. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Let's see. If I sit, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I need to get used to this kind of workstation approach to lecturing. Uh, well, me. So the first thing to say is I'm really delighted to be here. I'm honored to be here. I understand that you are not expecting me. So we'll have to bear our kind of collective disappointment together. Um, I'm going to present some work that I developed in relation to a visit from someone called Jane Bennett, who is a political philosopher. Um, from Baltimore, who came to work back a month ago or so, and in relation to her visit, I wrote something related to my own research on motherhood and objects. I don't know if you have this experience, but when you're very heavily involved in writing a paper, you absorb lots of theory and you're sort of really involved in it, and you, understand, you think you understand what you've written, and then a month goes by and you go back to what you've written, and you read it, and you think, Christ, I don't know what that means. So there's going to be some sections of this paper you're going to have to help me with as I map my way back through some of the theoretical articulations. It's quite uh, wide-ranging in its reach, but it's take in a whole lot of different areas to do with feminist theory, some theories of motherhood, some aspects of object, object relational psychoanalysis, alongside some uh, interests that I've had, sort of dabbling really in the sort of OOO field, realism, which I think some of you might know more about than I do. So we'll have to help each other along. Uh, yeah, a word that Mark mentioned about my background. I suppose I often try to think about my history, if you like, as a series of kind of unfolding practices. So that first set of practices over the first sort of decade of my working life was very much involved in a kind of experimental theatre collective that was trying to work out questions, I suppose, about how it is that one proceeds, how does one make theatre work. Um, and after that, I've been involved in, I guess, questions of psychotherapy, which in some ways has the same kind of question to you. How does one proceed as a psychotherapist? What is that project about when you go into a room with somebody and you don't yet know in advance what's going to happen? And then I had some kids, and motherhood appeared to me a similar kind of practice in which one's kind of catapulted or thrown into an experience that uh, you're not prepared for. You need to keep working away at that question about what is this thing that I do called motherhood? And then I guess more recently this practice of academia and writing. And I've worked for a while on a form of writing that I call anecdotal theory after some work by Jane, another Jane, not Bennett, I'll remember her name in a minute, Gallup, Jane Gallup, who wrote a book called Anecdotal Theory that tries to generate a theory out of uh, writing personal anecdotes or thinking the personal through the literary form of the anecdote. So there's a bit of anecdotal writing in here that we're going to talk about later as a form. Okay, I've got four slides. And I'll turn the lights down when they come up so you can see them, and then we'll come back up again so I don't sit in darkness. All right, I'm happy to take questions during the talk if people want me to repeat things or 
the understand things and at the end we'll open up and have a discussion of some kind. Okay. I don't know what Mark introduced the paper as being called originally, but this is what it's called. It's called Object Orientated Maternalities, which is a kind of ironic take on another articulation of O O M, which I'll describe later on. Okay, so in recent work, I've been concerned with thinking through gendered dimensions of public life by tracking the peculiar, we might say queer, figure of the mother. And I've tried to follow mothers and their stuff, their babies and buggies and bags and bottles, across what Marc Auger calls the non-spaces of supermodernity. So from top floor tower blocks to the street, from the street to the other side of the street, along pavements, around or over street furniture, on and off buses and down escalators, into a city's underground networks that form uncomfortable, if not impossible, assemblages with maternal bodies and on across those strange in-between spaces of the supermarket car park, cash machine queue, the strip outside the school gate, public cultural spaces, leisure centres, cafes designed for unencumbered bodies, urban parks, playgrounds, doctor surgeries, the park again. All those public places that maternal work actually takes place. And I've tried to notice the quiet making and unmaking of the public as mothers go about the city through the ways they are called on to enact a boundary between citizen and not yet citizen in daily mundane acts of mothering in public space. If queer is a critical framework for a persistent and ongoing challenge to normativity in all its forms, from the hegemony of capitalism to the interrelated strictures of the heterosexual social matrix, then it's perhaps a little odd to claim that tracing the desire paths of mothers of all subjects as they go about their daily practices, that is spatial and temporal and material practices, can be claimed under the banner of queer. However, whilst motherhood, even in its most varied ontic forms, quite clearly is a social institution that underpins the normativity of capitalist reproduction, and may or may well not have something to do with heterosexuality as a lived and embodied practice, I've argued that the particular encounters that we could call maternal encounters hold open the potential for a radical form of ethics, one that runs counter to capitalist modes of productivity, temporality, and exchange. So in that former work, I've drawn both on Levinas in his account of radical alterity, but also on Alain Bagieux's notion of love that treats the condition that there are two radically disjunct positions of experience that can't know one another, as well as a long history of feminist metaphysics that's argued in different ways for the not one. And I've been concerned then with building out of those theoretical uh, tools a specifically maternal ethics. So the task, I suppose, for those of us working in maternal studies involves something about thinking maternal ethics beyond the kind of classic figure of the angel in the house. That's Virginia Woolf's famous characterization of the sort of uh, female masochist, basically, the one who is prepared to give herself up or for the sake of the other. And valorizes the ways that one human subject may step aside for a more vulnerable other. And so that figure of the mother gets easily assigned and aligned, I suppose, with uh, that angel in the house. And perhaps because of the inherent vulnerability of infants and the psychoanalytic notion that human development proceeds through a series of psychic separations from the maternal body, from the maternal sphere, seen as essential for the precipitation of speaking subjects. So a lot of, a lot of my work on maternal ethics has been concerned with that very difficult place that mothers or the maternal figure in, in, in public culture gets uh, aligned with in terms of either the person who steps aside or the figure who needs to be totally abjected in the end in order for a speaking subject to emerge as a separate, a separate entity. So that attempt then is kind of, the attempt in my earlier work is kind of uncomfortably framed, if you like, by Levinasian ethics on the one hand and by a Badurian insistence that it is in the realm of the same that we must look for how the one comes to count and hence for the emergence of a subject in relation to a situation and not in relation to an altogether one. So that's an example of a place where theoretical uh, frameworks might be totally themselves disjunct and yet we still try to work with the incommensurability of two different accounts of human subjectivity. <coughs> However, 
my count of maternal mortality also listens out for the call of other kinds of others, and in particular, non-human others. So hence my interest in stuff, drawing on Heidegger's notion of Zeyuk, in things and their thingness, drawing on Jane Bennett's shift from object to thing, and in the inanimate, dumb materiality, uh, that lack on looks with the real of the maternal body, but is, of course, far from dumb. There's a long history of thinking maternal bodies in relation to a certain kind of object or dumb materiality in the concept. So I'm grateful um, to Michael O'Rourke, uh, a colleague from Dublin, who's gathered up the things that I've dealt with in recent writings into a list, a literary form that I too am particularly fond of for its capacity to place word things alongside one another, grouping them into odd assemblages. So here's a maternal object list that I've tried to uh, work with recently. It includes clothes, blankets, quilts, bottles, teats, milk powder, sterilizers, breast pumps, feeding spoons and bowls, juice bottles, bibs, pacifiers, <coughs> mobiles, rattles, nappies, wipes, changing mats, creams, powders, cribs, cots, babies, baby monitors, prams, buggies, carry cots, slings, backpacks, car seats, and so infinitely ever on. That's a quote from my film, very helpfully gathered up my work into that list. So these maternal assemblages also concern uh, features of the post-industrial city. I skimmed that quickly. I'm talking about a maternal assemblage, okay? Not just a material one, but a material maternal assemblage. And they have something also to do with the post-industrial city. The curb, for example, has a particularly lively encounter with plants and with mothers who push them as does traffic and its noise and fumes, pavement gum, rubbish, the earth, grit, cigarette stubs and dog shit around street trees, street furniture designed for purposes other than climbing and swinging. Uh, secluded, already damp corners that provide cracks for peeing. Mothers and cities don't just negotiate these obst obstacles, but are porous to the ways that these obstacles reciprocate in maternal work. Together, we could say, they mother. And I've argued that the ethics of objects that reciprocate demands to be taken seriously. So as much as possible, I've tried to follow Jane Bennett's suggestion to foreground things and background human consciousness by centralizing prams, for instance, with their appendages, that is mothers, babies, buggies, and buggy boards, to see what they may reveal about publics and citizens and politics as much as the relational realm of mother infant interaction. So through a comparison, that is, between the incorporated <coughs> figure of the mother, weighed down by stuff, yet newly alert to the feeling of things, and the free runner, the parkour artist who jumps the metropolis, I've proposed a viscous maternal subject whose attunement to the smells and sounds and touch of the city increases as she becomes more and more physically impeded within it. As a result, I've argued, a kind of politics, if we understand politics to include the small acts, the ways that small acts, in this case mothering, bring small and transient publics into being. I've argued that this is a kind of maternal politics we can render from watching the mother in the city. This is not to say that mothers are not involved in constant human-centered acts of uh, discernment, of assessing, for example, what an object may present that may be helpful or useless, or making judgments about the distinction between the safe and the unsafe, what's allowable, what might be an imposition on others in public space, the boundary between what might be appropriate in public and private, the distinction, if you like, between good and bad stuff. There's a whole set of arguments about plastic stuff and wooden stuff and organic stuff and non-organic stuff and so on that goes on all the time. Much of which is performed in places of witness, whether the street, the doctor's surgery, or the airport. But I'm interested in disturbing the philosophical and structural position of the maternal principle in social and symbolic life, as ontologically she's been regularly figured in the history of European philosophy as the boundary between social life and the chaos of biology. And through her being as boundary, the boundary is instigated and materialized. There's a long history of, for example, Julia Kristeva's work on thinking the maternal sort of function in public life as a form of psychosis that uh, sits at the border between the speaking subject, that is the social symbolic realm, 
and the realm of the chaos of biology. So she, if you like, becomes a self, a boundary or a kind of placeholder for that distinction. And that's not a great way to build a subjective, but a kind of theory of the subject as a placeholder or a container and so on. So I've been uh, concerned to try to slightly upset or dislodge that particular characterization. So instead I've tried to embrace the ethicality, sociality and vibrancy of things, both human and non-human, that all engage in the social practice we call mothering. So in doing so, mothering becomes something more shared, more spread, more open to different influences and desires, including the desires of objects, and philosophy becomes more porous to queer articulations of the boundaries or distinctions between the social, natural, and biological. So that shared boundary work is my version of what Jane Bennett calls, following that tour, distributive agency. How are you doing so far? Can you hear? <coughs> okay, <coughs> okay. All right, so in this largely theoretical paper, I want to return to thinking about mothers, stuff, and cities through an engagement with the philosophical perspective on objects, materiality, and reality that assumes social practices like mothering might be shared and enacted in assemblages with human and non-human actors, but tries to keep its eye more firmly on the autonomy of objects themselves. So this paper is going to look at the notion, if you like, of autonomy and how that might relate also to the developing sort of subjectivity of the infant and the mother's role in that. I first want to form a, perform a kind of auto-critique on my own earlier work, trying to track my object orientation that seems to succumb to a creeping anthropocentrism, just as I seek to eradicate it, and think through why this might be the case when my primary concern is motherhood. And secondly, I want to try to address this tendency by taking a cue from Jane Bennett's recent reflections on the practice of hoarding objects. I don't know if some of you have seen that talk on YouTube or elsewhere on the internet. So this is just post her work on vibrant matter, very related to it, but she's done some really interesting work on people who hoard things. And think about the ways that the specificity of mothers who hoard their children's objects. So where Bennett alerts us to the ways that some people such as people who hoard, may be more sensitive to the call of objects than others. I want to think about the process of becoming a chosen or cherished object through an account of maternal hoarding. So given that a crucial part of maternal practice is precisely to help an infant both belong to and feel chosen out of the generic, through having a sense of themselves as specific, as singular and individual, my hunch is that maternal hoarding could offer object oriented ontology, a nuanced model for encountering autonomous objects. This is half a ton in cheek, as you can see. In the final section, <coughs> I shall return to cities and think about the city itself as a sieve that filters objects through paying, paying close attention to the grids that cover grains. Okay. <laughs> We're going to begin with an eternal anecdote. Well, I'm going to give you one slide. <coughs> now, you can't see that, right? Okay, this is a very poor photograph I took on my mobile phone. In my son's room, I'll explain about it in a minute. Here's the anecdote. I am no longer allowed to walk uninvited into my children's rooms. I need to knock and gain entry. <coughs> if I'm given permission to enter, then I mustn't touch or tidy. I am allowed to exchange grunts, keep my eyes to myself, and leave, perhaps prizing a dead tea bag or sticky teaspoon from a congealed spot on a desk or window ledge. <coughs> but when they are out, and I am at home and stuck with my writing, I am drawn to their rooms, and in particular to their stuff. I know I shouldn't enter, but there are certain objects that seem to call to me, that I visit, handle, adjust, dust, and reposition. These objects are not the obvious ones, not the ones that I have uh, gifted to my children, nor the beautiful ones, nor the ones that hold particular memories. They are not the ones that speak of their babyhoods, although I know parents who do hoard those kinds of objects, Attics full of prams, the first socks, 
cherished rattle, a drawing, objects that have the imprint of babyhood literally embedded in them, kept as a talisman warding off bad spirits, especially the potential death of a child. Neither are they the mounds of lost, loan gloves or children's shoes that people collect in streets and parks, or photographs stranded on railings, or turn into artworks. That's my only reference to art in your whole piece. I'm talking instead about odd objects, weird even, that have, that have pitched up as if it were from nowhere. Ugly ones that seem to have nowhere to go and whom no one in particular is attached to. They reappear at the bottom of toy boxes, on the edge of a shelf, in the back of the room, <coughs> but something about them forbids their relegation as rubbish. They are the objects that fail to get lost. No one drops them or impales them on the railing so they can be found. They don't disappear into that great underworld of objects where the borrowers live, beneath the floorboards or behind the skirting. When they turn up, they are met with an ambivalent response. Oh, there's that thing again. They might be cousins of Odredek, Kafka's much mentioned wooden spool, who straddles the line between inert matter and vital life, to quote Bennett. Plastic yet alive, ontologically disturbing, exposing the continuity between rocks and life and the becoming of things, another quote from Bennett. This would be the counterpart to Winnicott's transitional object. Rather than the thing that's loved to bits and is eventually lost, disintegrates or gradually disappears, these odd objects are childhood things that no one really wants, but they pitch up again and again, demanding to be constantly refound. Oh, there's that thing again. My younger son is a collector, a stopping point on its way to hoarding. His shelf is a 19th come 21st century cornucopia, a cabinet of curiosities. There are glass jars with dead scorpions, shells and bones, bits of pottery that sit bunched up against a pair of 3D glasses, a tin from Peru, sheathed knives, fake medals, plastic trinkets, carved animals, rings. I love his shelf too. Many of the objects I chose myself and gave to him out of a shared delight in things. But out of all his things, it is only this cousin of Odredek whom I visit. The plastic is heavy and beautifully moulded. The wings move in relation to the body, but I am slightly repelled by the eye, its larval appearance, and quickly return it to its place. <coughs> okay. This section is just called speculative realism. And many of you will know some literature here that um, you've had people talking about speculative realism over the last year or so, so you can help me along. So the suggestion of foregrounding things and backgrounding human consciousness as a deliberate strategy for generating fresh ideas about politics, ecology, sociality, ontology and metaphysics is part of a more general return to an interest in realism in philosophy and a turn away from the predominance of discourse, textual critique, cultural analysis, and the demystifications of the workings of power in critical theory. I'm not saying that people working in speculative realism have turned away from those things, but there's a sort of uh, an interest in developing an alternative realm, if you like a thought, that might lie alongside those critical practices. It also distances itself from the kind of relational position on objects that's prevalent in material culture studies, where the study of objects allows us to more profoundly understand people as they are seen to express, frame, and socialize relationships. So that could be that, that kind of work on the sort of relationality of objects, really, in order to understand people better. You could see in, in the anthropologist Danny Miller's work, for example. He has a view on, um, I suppose, deliberately retaining an anthropocentric view. Even, for example, the category of mother in his work could be viewed as a kind of intentional object burst by the gap between ontic and ontological realms. Whereas this new branch of realism is less concerned, I think, with understanding people, and perhaps particularly un uninterested in understanding mothers, and more attuned to how objects understand, or at least encounter one another, regardless of human access to the world. So this term is sometimes referred to as speculative realism, a term that arose in relation to a now infamous workshop that took place here at Goldsmiths, as I'm sure you would know, in 2007, with Ray Brassier, Ian Hamilton Grant, Quentin Mersu, and Graham Harmon, organized around Mersu's book, After Finitude, which itself has become a kind of er uh, text in its emergent field. And there have been many subsequent discussions taking place in the pages of journals such as Collapse and Speculations, 
and on numerous weblogs dedicated to speculative realism and post-continental philosophy. So though the umbrella term speculative realism has now been rejected, I think, by Ray Brassier, who first coined it, but reclaimed by Graham Harmon, but with the addition of capital, capital letters, it does group together a range of philosophical perspectives that share an opposition, uh, opposition to correlationist philosophies. So Brassier states, the only thing that unites us is antipathy to what Quentin Mercer would call correlationism, the doctrine that is especially prevalent amongst continental philosophers that humans and world cannot be conceived in isolation from one another. A correlationist is any philosopher who insists that the human world correlates his philosophy's sole legitimate concern. It's a quote from Rebassi. In other words, what loosely groups speculative realists together is that opposition to the notion that we only ever have access to the correlation between thinking and being, but never to either term considered separately from the other. There's even a website called the Speculative Realism Pathfinder um, to help you find your way around, which draws an analogy between the term postmodernism in the way it holds together diverse theories united in that position to the modernist project of enlightenment. So it sort of makes a parallel between that and the Speculative Realism sort of term. It's a very loose now sort of grouping of a whole range of different philosophical perspectives held together by opposition to correlationist thinking. So given my passion for lists, here is the list I've drawn from the Speculative Realism Pathfinder. It goes like this. So this is a loose grouping of uh, ideas we might group under the term Speculative Realism. Atom Network Theory, uh, Assemblage Theory, Dark Vitalism, Illuminative Materialism, Methodological Naturalism, Neo-Vitalism, Object Oriented Ontology or Philosophy, on Ontecology, Revisionary Naturalism, spe Spectral Realism, Speculative Materialism, Speculative Realism, uh, Transcendental Materialism, Transcendental nihilism, transcendental realism. Okay. An interest in objects having lives of their own beyond human comprehension is a sphere that's usually given over to science. And it's this uptake of this position as a concern of philosophy that I think is at stake here. So speculative realism is therefore an attempt to reanimate, I think, a debate about the being of objects beyond what we can know of them that falls neither into a simplistic refutation of idealism, nor gives over the ground of reality to science. So the way Harman puts it, this philosophical perspective rejects any privilege of human access to the world and puts the affairs of human consciousness on exactly the same footing as the duel between canaries, microbes, earthquakes, atoms, and tar. Harman concedes that this might sound like a defense of scientific naturalism that reduces everything to physical events, However, Harman, whose focus is on object oriented metaphysics, dubbed OOM or OOO, opposes naturalism by insisting that we still have no idea how physical relations or any other kind are possible in the first place. So we can only speculate on objects. For Harman, this has to do with how objects, including humans, touch one another indirectly or vicariously, which is something I'm going to return to later in the paper. So OOO to OOF to OOM. Although the list above suggests interesting new assemblages, for example, group, it groups atom network theory, assemblage theory, and OOO together, both underlining their differences as well as their potential similarities. It's worth noting, perhaps, its omissions. There's no mention here, for instance, of feminist neo-materialists who have long explored the non-human, machinic or monstrous, the inorganic, the materiality of the body, and the vibrancy of matter, including Jane Bennett's work, the work of Elizabeth Sanders, Elizabeth Grosh, Rosie Gray Dotti, Myra Hunt, Karen Bar uh, Barat, uh, Donna Haraway, Claire Colbrook, as Michael O'Rourke notes in his excellent essay that queers speculative realism that's entitled Girls Welcome. He adds to this those working on the sex appeal of the inorganic, such as Mario Perignola those working on persons and things, such as Bracha Ettinger and Barbara Johnson, and what he playfully calls object oriented maternality, OOM, as a twist on object oriented metaphysics, which might include even someone like me. In doing so, he expands the parameters of the field so that we can begin to see new theoretical reverberations between a whole host of perspectives <laughs> from domains beyond philosophy. 
philosophy. Whether it's working in critical theory, or in literature studies, or feminist science studies, or even maternal studies, bring their own encounters with objects, materiality, and the real, into proximity with the concerns of speculative realism. O'Rourke notes in his essay that a discussion did open up in uh, the kind of blog sphere in 2010 around the question of what an object-orientated feminism might look like. A question that was in part responded to by two panels during a conference that year organized by Catherine Bihar. <coughs> Her own contribution was a paper entitled Botox Ethics that queer the relationship between living and dead objects, exploring um, body artists who incorporate inertness or deadness into the living self. I'm just going to quote from um, Bihar's uh, writing. She writes, with Botox, living objects elect to become a little less lively. Botox represents an important ethical gesture, a face-first plunge for living objects to meet dead objects halfway, to locate and enhance what is inert in the living and extend towards inaccessible deadness with ne necrophiliac love and compassion. Botox, Botox ethics hints at how object-orientated feminism might subtly shift object-orientated terms. Resistance to being known twists into resistance to alienation. Concern with qualities of things reconstitutes as concern for qualities of relations. And speculation on the real becomes performance of the real. Botox ethics exper experientially transforms empathy for dead counterparts into commingled sympathy. That's the end of the quote. So here, feminist concerns with alienation, for instance, with the quality of relationships and with enactment and performativity, re-enters debates about ontology, thingness, and the real. If some human subjects, in other words, have felt the ongoing effects of being objects in the lives of others, if the association of dumb matter has stuck to some bodies more than others, it may offer this subtle shift in object-orientated ontology. Feminisms might therefore decide to remain attached to the question of whether the quality of relations between things matters and not just concern themselves for things in and of themselves. This particular answer to what an object-orientated feminism might look like is not without its tensions in feminist theory. So Sarah Ahmed, who's based here, has written um, interestingly uh, that neo-materialists such as, as Elizabeth Grosch, Vicky Kirby and Elizabeth Wilson make claims that fem feminism abandoned the body, science, nature, materiality, and biology, so as to justify their reclamation of these realms under the banner of the new materialism. This, she claims, is something of a straw argument, as it ignores decades of work in feminist science studies and some branches of psychomotic theory that have remained interested in the realms of biology, nature, materiality, and the body. What emerges from her argument is a, a version of feminism that is supposed to be suspicious of nature in favor of culture. B, a version of feminism that's supposed, uh, no, that constructs feminism as being, uh, have I done that? Ah, yes, B. A version of feminism that constructs feminism as being suspicious of materialism in order to justify its own championing of materialism. And C, we've got there, a construction of feminism that never forgot its material grounding. But I would agree with Vicky Kirby that despite the inherent commitment to ungrounding within feminist critical theory, feminist discussions of materialism do potentially mean to <coughs> ground on some of the enduring sites for feminist inquiry and contestation. And this is a troubling thing to do. As Kirby argues, although it would become accepted in critical theory uh, that the actual ground upon which an argument will take its leverage can have no enduring stability or universal commitment, that was a quote. Nevertheless, feminism has been consistently concerned with separating matter from, for example, information and its related corollaries, nature from culture, body from mind, emotion from reason, in order to notice the persistent association and ongoing effects of that association between feminine nature, body, and emotion. This doesn't include important work in feminine science studies, for who, you know, where scholars have been working on nature, body, emotion, and matter that have always been objects of interest. But as Kirby warns, even the most sophisticated thinkers whose energies are devoted to refusing the political agenda that the division presumes will often build an intervention on an intractable er-ground that entrenches it. 
So for example, she looks at the explanatory logic of Bruno Latour's inclusion of nature into culture to allow for an expanded notion of sociality. And Judith Butler's insistence that culture is the culture's very relation to nature is one of ontological difference, making their positions rather similar to one another. Difference, says Kirby, is conceived in terms of the separation from or attachment to another entity. Human exceptionalism gets reinstalled for both thinkers, she argues, either as what is attached to or what one separates from. Instead, and perhaps in keeping with Bihar's Botox ethics, we need to reorientate ourselves to understand nature's constant reinvention as always already including human exceptionalism, not something that is either explained by it or incorporated by an expanded notion of actor, actor networks. It's not that nature needs to come in from the cold, but perhaps the other way round. In Kirby's terms, there is just one force field of diffracted articulations, technologies, and inventions, of which humankind is just one element. However, this returns us to just one force, one force field, and it has its own problems, as we'll see later when we get to Graham Harmon's work. Are you still doing okay? Yeah, getting a bit dense. We'll move on. Another obvious point of tension between object-orientated feminism and an ongoing feminist project of demystification, which pays particular attention to binary oppositions, is the ways that tropes of activity and passivity are utilised in what we could loosely call vitalist arguments. So recent discussions of vibrant matter, for instance, attempt to notice that simply everything, even the most apparently inanimate, solid, and if you like, stolid material objects, are in fact lively, in motion, and in dynamic relation with, one, with other lively matter, albeit at different temporal rates from human consciousness. Cultivating an attentiveness to non-human forces, both inside and outside the human body, constitutes what Jane Bennett calls a, cult a counter-cultural kind of perceiving, gnawing away at the life matter boundary or binary that can give the lie to ideas that the world consists of active and agentic human subjects who confront passive objects and the laws that govern their mechanisms. Noticing the vibrancy of matter is itself a political project, one that seeks to stop the ongoing exploitation of human beings, by human beings, of the natural and artificial world, <laughs> not just through the practice of ongoing critique and exposure of the workings of power, but through opening ourselves to the presence of impersonal affect, that's Jane Bennett's term. However, we might argue that noticing that nothing in the end is passive, and only celebrating matter's vibrancy, which might be another way of incorporating sociality into nature rather than the other way around, may overlook some of the qualities I've tried to elucidate in tracking the viscosity of maternal assemblages. Certain assemblages, in other words, hold back, impede, and tether the objects that constitute them. Certain objects stick to certain bodies and not to others. And sometimes objects have to play dead in order to survive. The stuckness affecting bodies differentially is what Nina Power alludes to when she talks about perky passivity as a way to describe the alignment of feminism and consumerism under neoliberal conditions. It's also a more general condition, as Ida Southwood argues, the result of constant precariousness and, re and restless mobility of populations who are dependent on a relentlessly updating market-driven technology that leads to cultural stagflation and a population who are revving up without getting anywhere. The result, he says, is a kind of frenetic inactivity. We're caught in a cycle of non-stop inertia. So Auger's non-place, Southwood argues, becomes visible when we're stranded and immobilized, which is precisely, I would argue, what maternal viscosity reveals, that kind of stuckness that I try to describe in other work around mothers and their things trying to get around cities. And as Lauren Belant has catalogued so brutally in her recent work, the practices of cruel optimism that keep us treading water, maintaining the fantasy of a good life while remaining as far from it as we ever were, characterizes perhaps our era. These are all examples then of ways in which, though we may follow through on the project of attending to the vibrancy of matter, we need to also attend to the constant counterpull of matter that fails to vibrate. I would argue that this double attention is the contribution of OOF to OOO. Okay. 
Frank, what's the time? network theory to shift from mother-child dyad to an assemblage that could take in the complexity of dynamic, emergent, and contingent mother-child object relations that didn't reduce object to a psychoanalytic notion of an internalized experience of breast, penis, baby's womb, following Klein, or the always already lost objects that constitute the ego, following Freud. Despite the tour's insistence on things that act, whether human or non-human, his work also suggests some ethics by describing some objects as rude. And noticing what things do for one another. So it's got a very famous uh, early example in the sociology about a door closing, and um, the door, the piston that stores up energy and that closes in the face of some people who pass and not in the face of others. So he tries to develop a kind of ethics of objects through thinking about rude objects, the door, piston being a rude, a rude kind of object that responds to some people and not to others. Those carrying heavy parcels, for example, can't easily uh, get the door to open. This capacity for objects, and especially artifacts, um, to reciprocate with one another is also present in Elaine Scarry's work on the body in pain. Do people know that book? A very famous old book from the 1980s called The Body in Pain. People tend to read the first half, which is about pain and torture, <laughs> and then they don't read the second half, which is about the imagination and the unfold of human experience. She thinks that a uh, human experience basically is framed between these two poles of pain and the imagination. Pain is the marker of the limit of the possibilities of language to communicate experience. Imagination is that which exceeds language through the acts of making things up and making things real. That's really relevant to you guys. Despite the profound humanism in her work, I've uh, been indebted to Scanning for an account of the ways that objects that we make, whether mass produced or individually crafted, might be understood to reciprocate or give back to humans in unexpected ways um, that exceed the intention of the imaginative labor that went into their making. For Scarry, objects are not simply the residue of human imagination, but reveal their ethical capacities. She writes, the most ordinary and routine artifacts are characterized by excess, an excess that is of reciprocating the action that emanates from within an object. So when a plastic bottle is developed to hold medication and it has a lid that clicks when a child tries to open it, but responds differently when an adult pushes down and then turns the lid, she's making a claim um, that that kind of object is able to basically understand something of the, the human intention in trying to open the object. So she thinks about the ethicality of that bottle's lid. Um, the bottle designer's intention to protect children from the harmful effects of medication can't yet anticipate a kind of cascade of revisioning that takes place between the maker and the object, such that whatever effects were intended are magnified multiply in numerous directions so that the object makes new vibrant assemblages with unknown consequences. <coughs> Scarry's human psychic space is strung out between pain, which is an intentional state with no intentional object, and imagining which is an intentional object with no intentional state, leading her to conclude that pain is the imagination's intentional state. In other words, we're trying to decrease one another's pain when we make things. And, uh, uh, and imagination is pain's intentional object. In other words, that's what gets destroyed when we're in pain. When she follows through the former claim that pain is the imagination's intentional state, she arrives at the idea that all making, which is a form of sentient work that involves pain, when we work we're in labour and it's painful. At some level there's an impulse to externalise and therefore reduce harmful sentient states. States that although projected by the maker onto the object nevertheless remain interior to the object itself. This is revealed for instance in contemporary lawsuits involving pro uh, product liability, in which artefacts are expected to, to know much more than their human makers. So when that bottle has failed to protect the child, the law asks a question not of the maker, but of the bottle, about what it knew 
of the status of the person that opened it and whether it failed in its task of knowing. In trials involving explosions that have harmed human bodies, for example, gas must know about the problem of being cold and the problem of allowing raw objects to enter the body, and it must know that in its original state it's unsmellable to humans, and that when it's unsmellable, it's dangerous to humans. So although sort of formerly the manufacturer of the gas appliances on trial, even in contemporary legal cases, the object is expected to internalize within its design an active awareness of human pain. The imaginative act of producing the artifact remains mysterious, invisible, and only disclosed in the material and verbal residues she leaves behind. Therefore, it is the interior structure of the object that contains the record of the invisible action. Now, that kind of account is deeply humanistic in its uh, intentions and perhaps goes against some of what we've been uh, outlining around um, object-orientated philosophy. So she can't quite move, I think, beyond the view that the inanimate world is made sentient through human acts of making up and making real. The inanimate world comes to care about human pain through a kind of loop in which the imagination creates an object that in its turn reciprocates because of the residue that an imaginative act has left on the interior of the object when it, which in its turn recognises human pain. And here I think we could move to Graham Harmon's um, ideas about vicarious objects. I'm going to spare us all a detailed explanation of that. But basically Harmon is interested also in the autonomy of objects how the objects interact with one another outside of the loop of human awareness of objects. And he develops a whole set of ideas about um, vicarious causation, the ways that objects, I think he thinks, have a kind of fourfold structure. They are um, sensual objects with sensual qualities, and they are real objects with real qualities. But I think his theory has a similar kind of uh, structure to it in thinking that actually objects touch one another through a kind of interiority, if you like, to one another. Um, that's a little bit like uh, Scarry's idea of a residue being left internal to the object itself, that then is the cause of reciprocation. If you want, we can go into that a little bit in the question session. Some of you might be reading Harmon's work and have a better understanding of the closed causation than I do, because I wanted to see if we can get on to thinking a little bit about psychoanalysis and mothers again. Okay, this last section is called Finders Keepers. Oh, there's that thing again. In Powers of the Horde, then it is suggested that people who hoard things may have an inbuilt sensitivity to the call of things, or what she names as thing power, the thing power of objects. Related to Spinoza's notion of conatus, in which everybody, human and non-human, has a power that strives to persist, and to Henry Thoreau's wildness, his notion of wildness, that describes a not quite human force that alters human and other bodies, a dimension of matter that remains out side, thing power aims at the independence from subjectivity possessed by things. Describing this as the it as actant. Then it wants to shift from epistemology, what we cannot know of the outside, to ontology, an active, earthy, not quite human capacity for what she calls uh, vibrant matter. Without dismissing the distress, loss and grief that accompanies extreme hoarding, then it suggests that people who hoard um, are attuned to this it as actant. I mean, she's talking about people who are compuls compulsively hoard objects, so much so. I mean, there are lots of sort of American reality TV programs about hoarding now, I think there's some UK ones as well, but she's really talking about extreme states of hoarding where people uh, fill their houses with objects that they don't need and in a way have a very, I think, intense relationship with objects. So this it as actant is something she thinks people who hoard are attuned to, the aspect of objects that is both resistant to knowledge and also has power to act on other objects, including oneself. So objects, in other words, call to hoarders who heed that call. They call to a hoarder who passes a pile of what others might see as rubbish. Hoarders are people that can't bear not to take a piece of rubbish home. And these objects also call to one another, which hoarders notice and facilitate. For hoarders, objects seek each other out. They coagulate together according to strange forces that materialize as assemblage. Each item that is hoarded is specific, which is why the term rubbish can't apply. 
a hoard is a collection gone wild. So I've argued that previously that those who mother might be particularly attuned to processes whereby specific objects emerge from the generic. And in part I mean that the actants that we call infants need to be chosen out of the generic by somebody. Found, that is, in order not to feel unchosen or discarded and therefore like an imposter. And in order to go on to find other objects in later life. So I define mothers as those who are implicated in this choosing, anyone who is implicated in that kind of choosing of an infant into individuality, if you like. This is a slightly different discourse from that of bonding, which usually describes early processes whereby mothers and infants get to know one another. And it also sits at a certain distance from situating motherhood within the relentless kind of culture of choice that runs alongside neoliberalism. Okay, motherhood is thoroughly uh, <coughs> capitalised now, from eggs through to uh, the things that we use to provision uh, a child. But I just want to sort of slightly put that set of arguments to one side. Instead, I want to think about um, the perspective where assemblages that, that include mothers, baby, and stuff are what allows people to feel part of a structure of feeling. However, this perspective remains centered on what stuff does to suture social relations, whereas what we've been exploring is how stuff encounters and hides from one another, including humans. So we could say that the mother who goes to visit that odre deck, that fly creature, an ugly plastic indeterminate thing, which is neither toy nor ornament, yet somehow is so suggestive of liveliness or liveness that it's impossible to throw it away, is simply making visible the practice of finding an odd object that is, like an infant, ontologically disturbing, not yet chosen, not yet discarded, encountering and hiding at the same time. Freud's nephew plays Fort Da with a wooden spool, another odd deck, thrown away and refound, imagined as a drama between mother and child. But if following Harmon, objects themselves find one another through an intermediate kind of interior, interior thing that's interior to the object, this might be a better description of what Melanie Klein means by an internal object in psychoanalytic theory. When Freud's infant throws away and then refines that spool in order to master that experience of being left by the mother, Klein's infants encounter partial objects before they can bear to know that objects might be whole. Objects for Klein are still, people are, are people familiar with Melanie Klein's work at all? Is anyone familiar with <coughs> A few. One. Okay. So she still holds on to the idea of a life and a death drive in the same way as, as Freud does. So she's interested in internal destructiveness. But she has a, a set of ideas about the early phase of um, coming to relate to things that are only related to as partial, initially, abreast. Um, for example, or, and they, those things get invested with the drive, with, with, the, with, the, particularly with the death drive. And those things need to be then projected out in order to get rid of them, because they're felt to be internally very uh, destructive, or reinterjected, taken back in, in order to be able to manage the experience of being in proximity to a partial object. So a feeding assemblage, if we wanted to think about assemblage, alongside that set of ideas, could be said to include, say, the infant's lips, the interior of the mouth, you could include a milk powder manufacturer if you wanted to, or sterilizer equipment, a plastic teat, but we'd also want to include perhaps the infant's unconscious fantasies of its place in that assemblage, which is invested with the drive. So fantasy is itself an object affect thing that then distorts our encounters with other partial objects. So there's a set of ideas I've tried to develop there, there about how infants come to relate to others through a kind of thing-like experience with objects that's mediated by mothers. Okay, so the process of throwing things away on the one hand and fight, finding, hoarding and keeping things on the other are then related to one another and have at the core this question of the autonomous object that I've been trying to pursue and gesture towards that plastic fly creature that I called earlier my ugly deck. I'm just going to end with um, going back to Jane Bennett's opening section of Vibrant Matter. talking a little bit about rates in the city. Can you see that? Is it enough? We can go back up the, over the client section if you want. It's really about um, 
thingness thought in relation to maternal work. All right. My, I think it's really interesting that Jane Bennett opens Vibrant Matter with the following section on debris. On a sunny Tuesday morning on 4th June, in the grate, over the storm drain to the Chesapeake Bay in front of Sam's Bagels on Cold Spring Lane in Baltimore, there was one large men's black plastic work glove, one dense mat of oak pollen, one unblemished dead rat, one white plastic bottle cap, one smooth stick of wood. Stuff exhibited its thing power. It issued a call, even if I did not quite understand what it was as saying. I think it's really interesting, actually, that how much it sounds like a children's story, that um, one day, on a sunny day, the hungry caterpillar ate one apple, two pears, and then lay down and kind of felt sick. Not only does rubbish appear as a persistent figure that runs through so much work in this field that champions objects, but those working in OOO often give lists of radically heterogeneous things. Canaries, microbes, earthquakes, atoms and tar, glove, pollen, rat, cat, wood. Quite often they're listed as discarded objects that have been found by the theorists concerned and redeemed through a practice of noticing their thing power. As the early feminist performance artist Merle Latimer Nucalis has argued, throwing something away, turning objects into garbage, is a process of distorting those objects' distinctiveness. To call something rubbish is distributive of its inherent qualities, a kind of unnaming of autonomous objects that turns them all into the same mushy stuff. Nucalis' lifelong project is to elevate and, val and valorize sanitation work and other forms of what she calls maintenance, and those who perform it especially mothers, care laborers, cleaners, and the public institutions that support them. Their work is the disaggregation of rubbish, muck, dirt, shit, and mush back into separate and nameable objects, a process her maintenance art is also involved in. But even when these diverse and seemingly random groups of things are brought together, they still seem to form very personal assemblages, even though they purport to describe assemblages that are simply found lying there, waiting to be encountered. There is something aesthetic at work in putting tar alongside canaries, in noticing rats next to cap. Of course, we can say that this aesthetic element is itself at work all the time in vegetal life, for instance, as Jane Bennett has argued, for instance, in her thinking about the muskrat's tracks that resonate with the patterning of leaves. So we can talk about aesthetics in that sense if we want as itself kind of found. And Leo Bassani has a notion about aesthetic subjectivity, um, a sense in which things encounter one another in aesthetic ways. So the sensuous curl, for example, or erotic curl, we could say, of a kind of tendril around a stem that um, is part of Jane Bennett's work on, on Darwin's drawings. But even if this aesthetic is itself spread or shared across organic and inorganic life, if the poetic is what we find, not something that stems from human activity, the poetic still relies on some kind of sieving or selection whether this is a very human desire for things to be autonomous from us, when perhaps they have been pre-grouped through our particular tendencies towards noticing some objects and not others. So it's as if there's some kind of sieving or screening process at work, something I'm aligning with the work of mothering, that shows up a very human desire for things to be autonomous from us, when perhaps they've been pre-grouped through our particular tendencies towards noticing some objects and not others. That's not to say objects don't exist independently of us, but our desires for their autonomy may nevertheless be just that, our desires. So we might want to focus then, in Jane Bennett's glove, mat, rat, cat, stick assemblage, on the fact that she found it resting on a grate, covering a drain, that didn't make it into the assemblage at all. Gratings are fascinating objects in that they select what passes through into the drain and what remains on the surface. They are sieves that choose objects to retain and objects to lose and perhaps to refine again. There's a whole section of Henry May, who's famous book London Labour and the London Poor, about people who go down into the sewers in Victorian times to scavenge and bring back up to the surface things that have fallen through the drains. Basically recycle them. Post-industrial cities themselves seem to function through a series of grates or sieves like the barriers in the underground network system that allow certain bodies and luggage through and not others. And like the layout of roads, pavements, and cycle paths that act to sieve actants 
of different types who do or don't allow themselves to be sieved successfully. Cities provide mechanisms for sorting and sifting objects and attempting to put them in their place. When objects stray into places they're not supposed to, like kids riding motorcycles through parks, or mothers with prams on the underground system, what is shown up is the kind of mesh or sieve or grid itself. So rather than understanding the city as a labile, fluid, kind of organismic uh, assemblage, it's perhaps more precisely a sieve for disposing and keeping things with all the politics that this entails. So my final image I just want to leave you with is of the public hoarder. I just want to think about, what's a, I've been making an argument basically that we can think about the mother or the maternal as a form of kind of a principle of sieving that has something to do with choosing an object into life, if you like, um, in all of its itness or thingness. And I was thinking about the bag lady, it's kind of traditional figure in the city, a woman who keeps her cherished stuff in plastic bags around her body and sort of rakes the city for objects to call her, who call to her. So like a grating, she kind of chooses what to preserve and what passes through. So despite my desire, I suppose, to throw off the kind of creeping anthropocentrism in my own work, in my return to um, Elaine Scarry's work, for example, and talking about the particularities of this practice I'm calling mothering, it appears I've kind of reeled it back in again, the sort of fought dar in my own sort of relation, I guess, to uh, anthropocentrism. If Bennett's interest in borders is an attempt to render a certain kind of human activity as sensitively symptomatic of the contradictions of contemporary existence, then mothering perhaps should be understood as a kind of sieving, not exactly holding or containing in the uh, traditional sacramentic sense, but a certain kind of passive choosing that I'm suggesting is rendered visible in the relationship between the mother in my anecdote and that odd plastic fly creature that she calls her odd That's the end of my talk. I'm happy to go back over bits. I wasn't quite sure of the parameters of the talk in a way what you are familiar with and what feels very um, much like your bread and butter. So we can go back over or we can just roam around. Are you nice to have a general discussion just to have some points really rather than just questions? I, I can start get it down um, <laughs> because I don't mind. Are there any questions? Okay. Uh, I, well, I suppose I thought maybe you could flesh out a little bit. <coughs> I suppose to take a press words. Um, the relationship you set up quite in the beginning when you talked about how it might be useful for people who have been positioned as objects to others to pick up this kind of pick up a, a, a kind of in a feminist um, positioning for object oriented ontology. So whereas you have this because there's a there seems to be a real kind of discord or exciting space between sort of generations of feminism that have always been about looking for subjectivity. You go back to kind of Martin Nussbaum who names fungibility and um, violability as the two kind of things of sexual objectification with violability basically meaning sort of porousness, which is a word that you use all the time, and fungibility is kind of being interchangeable with other objects. So there's the one hand, the sort of line very much against the object, against the woman or the mother as object or as abject, and then this kind of shift where you're saying, well, if you're in that position, this might be a very good place to use object oriented ontology. So I, I thought maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Should we gather up some more points and then we can see if they relate to each other also? Um, I've got, I think another like, really interesting point about your presentation as well is that you were, you had, there were many bits in it, then also like the way that you were, the sort of amount of people that you talked about and the amount of people's work that you said that you dealt with or that we're going to deal with even during the presentation. 
was, I found it was really interesting. So also continuing on object oriented maternality, what that might mean if these theories or these authors are things as well, and what type of object oriented maternality would be if the presentation was one of these lists as a whole. Any more for the moment? Should we begin with those two? Is that your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting this thing about feminism and objectification, because it's not, it's sort of sometimes presented as something that belongs to an earlier set of discussions within feminism. And you find it particularly in the kind of Marxist feminist debates in the 1970s, also around alienation and objectification and alienation. So it's sort of around and not around, as if somehow we've got beyond thinking about women's bodies as objectified, something like that, and yet we also clearly haven't. Um, I suppose I was just a little, I've, I've been a little concerned about, in a way, the sort of intense democratization, which I also value in the um, object orientated or speculative realist turn, or the new materialist turn in a way, which is really about wanting, I think, to propose a politics almost around what happens if we try to destable hierarchies around the human and the non human, and sort of embed the human within a much wider, more spread, if you like, more equal set of relationships. So I think James Bennett, Bennett's work is political to the degree that it's, and it's slightly utopian in that it tries to propose an alternative sort of a uh, plane, a uh, kind of imminent plane, if you like, across which much more spread and shared encounters could be made visible. And I think that's fine and, and very good, but it doesn't necessarily destabilize very entrenched kinds of hierarchies, and particularly, I could say, around the intersections between gender, race, and class, which are the kind of classic ones, which is why I kind of wanted to bring back in that point that um, Nina Power makes in thinking about Ivan Southwood's work. It just to sort of remind ourselves that we might often be in situations where we look like there's a lot of movement or fluidity, but in fact we're totally and utterly stuck, which is what that sense of non-stop inertia is trying to get at. And I know that's a, in a way a completely different uh, mode of analysis, or there's a different object of analysis there. One is trying to analyse capitalism, if you like. And I think Jane Bennett's work is not particularly trying to analyse capitalism, it's trying to think about, yeah, I agree, there's some evidence there, but it's trying to propose assemblage as a way of uh, understanding a spread set of relations and therefore responsibilities for events, really. And I suppose one of the interventions I think that kind of something that we could still term feminism could make is to remind ourselves that objects to certain bodies and not necessarily to others. And my figure of the encumbered viscous mother, I suppose, but, um, and it's not necessarily a gender figure. It's a, I, I work pretty hard to propose that mothers are those people who choose to implicate themselves in that act of choosing. But that viscous figure is rather useful in comparison, say, to the figure who can perform parkour across the city, to think about what happens when uh, you are not necessarily able to perform fluid or feline kinds of gestures in relation to the objects of the city, and in fact completely impeded and yet attuned in a different way. So I've got some examples, for example, of mothers who cross roads with small children in the ways that you have to really, really slow down because you're crossing a road with a small child at the same time you're halfway across the fucking road, you know what I mean? And so you sort of become you know, incredibly aware of, of danger and sight and sounds and smells and things that the city offers to help you to, to do that work. So it's, it's really about thinking more creatively about objectification or objects in relation to this maternal figure. It's with and against that, that earlier feminist set of arguments. Would you like to come back on that? Okay. Okay. There's another very interesting point. So this point about lists of, lists of theorists and the presentation itself being a kind of list, something like that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's a really nice idea. I mean, what to say? I mean, I'm greedy as a theorist. So in some ways, uh, there is a sort of gesturing towards the connectivity between certain kinds of ideas. 
I think that um, the work that's been done on trying to queer speculative realism is really important in that it does join up or attempt to join up certain contemporary ideas about materiality and objects with other kinds of theories that have been doing the same kind of thing. And I suppose the intervention I always want to make is to say, oh, well, psychoanalysis has an awful lot to say about objects, and it's a slightly different kind of set of discussions. But at the same time, it's very useful to think psychoanalytic object in relation to the kind of material objects we've been discussing. If we follow a certain kind of psychoanalytic line that understands an infant's experiences as object-like, as dealing with something very object-like about relations, things that hurt and need to be pushed out, things that comfort and soothe and need to be taken back in, and so on. It's a very material aspect of... So I suppose I'm always looking for the ways that one thing relates to the other thing. Relates to the, other thing. the nice thing about lists is that the relation is not really made, it's just made through proximity. So the one term piles up against the next term and the next term without actually relating. So lists are a bit of a cheat because you don't need to do the work of producing sentences with meaning. You can just pile up objects next to one another. So they're kind of assemblages, really, I suppose. They're linguistic assemblages. Would you like me? Do you think that we can say um, that the idea of the objects and the relations images, this ideas, um, and also the way that you're talking about like, psychoanalysis and the relationship between like, an experience being like constituted almost by an object. But then I was also kind of wondering like in relationship to what you're talking about about being in Boulder, like what and in relationship to being like an academic, would this would this assemblage be an kind of object orientated? or a kind of academic object, of object oriented assemblage, or what, what would that, would it be? Would it be, would it be hoarder, or would it be academic, or would it be, like, I think that's a really interesting thing, so what type of um, assemblage it might be. So like an academic as Sib was great, is that, that's what you're getting at? It's great. The academic as a kind of Sib or great. Oh no, I was just wondering what you think, what, what type of one it might be. Oh, I see. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Can I ask somebody? I'm. I lost the question. I lost this one particularly. Um, I. Could you just go through the the sieve hoard mm. metaphor? Because to me, a sieve sorts things, so it's the opposite of hoarding. And I recognise you're trying to do something with it, but I can't quite get it. So if you, could you just do that? Could you go through that bit again? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you see what I mean about yeah, yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think I took my cue from Jane Bennett's work on hoarding to think about whether there are particular sensitivities to objects that cause worse, that refuse to be relegated as rubbish. And through the act, if you like, of noticing that call, they are called forth into the world of under, of, of differenti differentiated stuff, as opposed to... So lots of people, when you look at a hoarder's home, will see rubbish. Mounds and mounds and mounds of rubbish, so much so that, you know... And in a way, I'm always sort of a bit tentative about um, using examples because it's a very, very painful, I think, state to be in. And I think it involves lots of issues around grief and loss and what one might want to retain and hold on to, to manage certain kinds of psychic experiences. But let's just say that the kind of valorization that Jane Bennett gives hoarders is something to do with the capacity to notice that those objects are objects and have, if you like, a life of, of their own. So it's something about the capacity to see objects as differentiated. And I try to liken that to Merle Edmund and Cadiz's work, which is all about the, the kind of um, ways that one might be able to disaggregate marsh or rubbish back into its object list, something like that. And so all I was doing in working with the sieve red grid thing was noticing that uh, alongside that, Jane Bennett does her own version, I feel like, of listening to the call of things. There she is on her sunny day, looks down and finds a collection of objects. 
lo and behold. And they're always this incredibly aesthetic grouping of things. I mean, where the assemblage begins and stops is always really interesting. Where do you put a line around what constitutes the assemblage? What, what remain, what's in and what's out? Where do you stop? So there's, I think, always a kind of aesthetic choice in, in what it is about lists and notices. And of course, I mean, her examples are, are, are not just, I mean, that, that collection is a kind of metaphor, really, and she goes on in that book to think about, you know, the electricity blackout in, you know, 2004 or whatever it is, and thinks about the kinds of actors, players, in that that are corporations and the train lines themselves and the kind of metal of, you know, some line or whatever. So again, you've got to somehow draw a line around. And I suppose all I was trying to do at that moment was to think, okay, well, what's not made it into the assemblage? It's always a very interesting question to ask. What doesn't get into the assemblage? And there it was basically the great that all these things are lying on. It's all one object that she doesn't notice. And so I think I was just noticing that that process of sieving or it is something akin to a passive form of choosing. So it takes us away from the idea of motherhood as a kind of... Um, in a way, it was an embrace of the kind of passivity, femininity sort of link. But in doing so, trying to say, actually, that's akin to being attuned to a certain kind of core, in which you might do the very thing that infants need, which is to be chosen out of the generic, the mush, and into the realm of what we call the specific or individual. And that that sort of act is a kind of ethical act of choosing. It is a kind of passive, sibling kind of choosing which I would say is what the order is kind of doing. And I'm saying, I suppose, that the link with then my mothers who hoard thing is about saying, you know, does that object that I retained a relation to point towards a certain kind of ontologically odd thing that's lively and yet it is matter and might be a figure. And it is slightly tongue-in-cheek, but it's not, around what it means to choose an infant into, if you like, subjectivity. And that's part of a wider project of trying to say, okay, what happens to the maternal principle and psychomotic sort of literature around what constitutes the emergence of subjectivity? It's all actually about separation and um, the objection of the maternal sphere and this terrible worry about the clinging, caring mother in Christopher's terms and how basically you just need to get out of the flipping way to allow the emergence of the separate bounded, auto-effective, autonomous individual to come through. And I'm always trying to disturb, to slightly worry away at that. So it's a set of metaphors, really, around both using the maternal as a way to queer, if we like how we understand objects, and using objects to queer maternal labor, some kind of maternal labor. Why not? Yeah, well, I can't, I can't yeah, yeah, sorry, unless anybody else um, I think that also I recognise the mother of teenage children as the mother of teenage children. I think there's maybe a particular moment there, but we could talk about that another time. Um, I so so then so the, the the other question I have is um, uh, it belongs in a, in a kind of critical philosophical realm, which is are you in this process you're going through? Obviously, we're all trying to understand the relevance or none of speculative realism within our lives. But what I guess the question for me will be something like, what does this do to psychoanalysis that's useful for you, given that that's where you're rooted to a certain extent, despite the criticisms that you just outlined, which I can kind of concur with, versions of it, claims to be attempting to be profoundly anti-humanist, and psychoanalysis, in a sense, is the kind of, you know, the end game of a, of a kind of trajectory of humanism. And I just wondered what, you know, what, what the strategic thing for you, at, you know, the kind of at a macro level is in bringing those two regimes together. Yeah, yeah it's a really nice question. Do I have an answer? Um, well, I suppose there are lots of psychoanalyses, okay, so uh, it's a very heterogeneous field. And so there are versions of psychoanalysis, particularly Lacanian kind of thinking, in which you've already got a decentered kind of subject that is absolutely precipitated on a relationship with the other. And so you're not really in a human-centered you know, realm, you're in the realm of the subject rather than the self. And so there's already that kind of move there. 
And I guess because of multiple difficulties with Lacanian theory, I'm interested in alternative versions, if you like, of a slightly uh, dehumanistic, anti-humanistic version of psychoanalysis, which I think, in a way, you can get to via Laplanche. You can get to via the relational psychoanalysis in the States, just the Benjamin, etc. <coughs> slightly if you take into account some ideas of a kind of radical kind of otherness that comes at you, in a, certainly for La Planche, in a kind of state in which subjectivity is absolutely about being overwhelmed in the first place from something that comes at you from the outside, which for him is always sexual, which is how an unconscious comes into me, if you like. So I suppose those versions that, that it's, it's, they're, they're about an encounter with some kind of outside, let's put it like that. Um, and I suppose I'm always interested in multiplying what that outside might be, which is why ideas, for example, about feeding assemblages are quite helpful to think there's never just a mother and a breast. There's always a mother and a breast and some stuff, right? Always. And that, that stuff doesn't just mediate the relationship between mothers and infants but proposes a set of ethical encounters for mothers. And I've tried to work quite hard to think about what objects give back to mothers in their work to try to give objects actually a sort of genuine place in that kind of maternal work. So I think that can still sit within a psychoanalytic frame. It's about thinking about how objects are not simply just bits of maternal bodies, yeah, but have some other kind of material quality. Which is why the work of someone like Beyond, for example, becomes very important because for him, thoughts are objects. They're, chunk, they're sort of almost object like chunks of stuff that thinking comes into being to manage. So those kinds of ideas, which are deep, you know, they are psychomatic ideas, but they sort of work at the um, materiality of experience right from the beginning. I think there are ways within psychoanalysis that, of doing that that are helped by this kind of insistence of the life on the importance of encounters with things. Something like that. So then, yeah. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I have a very basic question. Too. Uh, one is if you could just expand on the Kafka idea of that object. I didn't, I didn't hear what it was called. And then also I just wanted to ask if the relationship to that object would be the same if it wasn't if it didn't belong to your son. And so therefore it's got it's like carries you know, the narrative of that object and its meaning is embedded in it. How would you respond to it in the same way if it wasn't? Yes. That's a good question. The object thing I think I um sometimes it's read the story, but Kafka has a short story about this school, wooden school which has kind of lively and inanimate qualities at the same time. And I suppose it's been picked up on by a number of different theorists as having, as sort of encapsulating, if you like, exactly this kind of uh, lively dead thing that I think many people are trying to articulate matter in, in terms of that kind of metaphor. And I was interested in, uh, in a way, that relationship between that kind of lively dead thing and that very famous Freudian sort of school so it's a school, it's, it, in the Kafka school story, it's a, whatever you thread, thread around it, as I understand it. So it's, a, it's something that's also linked to, if you like, the domestic and the tunnel work and things like that. Um, yes, I think that's right, that the odd thing that keeps turning up in the bottom of the toy box, and you think, why do we have this thing? Why does no one throw this thing away? Is, in a way, um, already within a relational field. For sure, for sure. But in a way, I suppose my point was in the way that things are supposedly found by a theorist on a grate, they are already in a relational field of some kind. I think, I think that was the point I was making, in a way. That that's the kind of creeping anthropocentrism I can't quite get away from and it gets reeled back in each time. So there is something intensely kind of aesthetic and poetic in much of this work, in terms of what it is that people supposedly find. And then to put canary next to tar creates a sense of, I mean, you're the artist, right? That has a certain kind of resonance to it that I would say is already part of a relational 
feels to things that matter to us, because they have certain kinds of qualities or certain kinds of connotations or certain kinds of colour, certain kinds of smells. So I don't make a distinction between that kind of relational field and the relational field of a mother who's got some stuff that no one wants to throw away, but no one has any kind of relation to. And that plastic thing is bizarre. My kids always go, I've got this thing, who gave it to us? No one can remember. No one's got any emotional attachment to this thing. And yet we don't actually throw it away because it sort of seems to represent something about liveliness and deadness that we're all slightly intrigued by. Yes, I don't know that I have anything uh, too substantial here, but the, the mention of the grill and the um, its filtering effect, the fact that the grill stops these objects in Bennett's story um, uh, from, from going down into the sewer and therefore opens them up to be perceived, visible, become visible. Um, the fact that you are forbidden from going into your children's rooms, perhaps enables things in the rooms to be seen in a manner that they wouldn't otherwise. And I'm thinking of these counter-narratives, typically one thinks of the city, uh, or one, one, one has these narratives of the city historically as being uh, something to be transgressed, to be permeable, whether in the way that the, the barricades in 19th century France were established to redraw the lines of, of, of travel through the cities. And in fact, passageways would be cut through buildings so that the um, the, the, the revolutionists could escape naturally, establishing new routes to the city. And then I'm thinking of Orson Welles' uh, Citizen Kane, that the life of the sewer becomes a mode of escape. Andrew Vider's film Canal, similarly, the Warsaw fighters, Jewish fighters escape through the canal. And then the, the practice of Gordon Matter Clark uh, seems always to have been one of treating the city as something to be transgressed, as something permeable whether breaking into a warehouse to cut out sections of it, or taking people on tours of the sewers in New York. So now whether those become uh, principally masculine orientations to the city, uh, seeing the city as something that should have no barriers, should have no barriers, whereas the mother is obliged really to deal with these barriers, and perhaps engages then in a, in a more, let's say, contemplative or sensitized um, relationship to the city as a result. Yeah. That was where I was. Yeah, very nice. I've written a piece about mothers in public space that tries to <coughs> elaborate that whole idea about desire paths, I guess, which are kind of carvings, aren't they, into the city um, because of use of a certain kind of pathway that's not a legitimate pathway. And how those desire paths are made around these kind of particular kind of practices around, for example, needing to access I don't know, rice cakes or something at some moment where your child doesn't seem able to cope without a rice cake or, you know, there's certain kind of paths through the city that allow certain public spaces to open up and other ones close down. So there's quite a lot about Cape Modern, that slope and uh, what it means to run cars down that slope over and over again with small children the retreat into these kind of public spaces by people who mother to look for ways of being in the city and carving kinds of desire paths in relation to public space. That has a particular relation to a set of maternal practices. But I've tried to then offset with that moment at the airport when the child unhooks the barrier, you know, when people are lining up and there's that really fascinating little thing on, you know what I mean? And then they unhook it and then there's this terrible moment where everyone goes, oh my God, the barrier between basically public and private life, if you like, what constitutes a citizen, has been undone, and everyone's been paranoid about terrorism, whatever, it was all lining up, and then it's gone, and then there's this terrible moment, and somebody basically sort of has to come forward and say to the child, no, 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 this is a barrier, you know, this is the distinction, if you like, between one kind of um, not yet citizen and one kind of public formation. And, and in, in some ways you could say my maternal figure is tasked with that act. So I've tried to exactly do that, offset these two things, the kind of making the transgressive movement through cities by this very, I don't know, in some ways many people, an interesting figure of the mother. She's not a revolutionary. She's not a criminal, and you know, <laughs> she has very little sex appeal. <laughs>
if you like. And so what's the politics of noticing those kinds of, of points of transgression and also the labour of the opposite, of the making of public life, if you like, through these very public acts of saying, no, no, this is a barrier and this is what it's for, is to filter some people and not others. And that's how public space works. So that's tasked to the mother in some ways, to publicly enunciate. This is what the barrier is for, this is why we have it, we need to put it back there. It's children wonderfully don't. Hi, um, I have a question if you could elaborate a little bit more on the relation of mothering and parenting, parenting yeah. because I was wondering if so many things that you would talk about is the work of mothering because we are formed by fathers or yeah. others. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was curious yeah. about that or if every person that engage, engages in these acts of mothering would be considered a mother even though it's a man. Yeah, sure, sure. It's an important question. I mean, I've always sort of carved out a kind of definition of a mother as somebody who chooses, if you like, to respond to the call of that other and elects that other as their child. And as far as I'm concerned, that can happen. Anyone can have, really, can have that kind of relation to another who also elects themselves in some ways to be a child. So I think there are all sorts of ways we can think about um, about intergenerational relations that cross all sorts of traditional boundaries between, around gender and around uh, age even, you know, children, we are, we're all children, right? for those, those, we are all children now, still, even if your parents are not with you anymore. So in that sense, I don't have a strict definition of a child and a, a parent, other, other than that very spread thing. But at the same time, I'm always wanting to honour, if you like, the history and the persistence of the assignation of child rearing to those kinds of bodies that uh, get named and claimed as female bodies. So in that sense, I thought about parenting in the feminine, if you like, as something to do with an honouring of that history and its uh, persistence, really, and how difficult it's been despite many, many decades of work to uncouple that particular uh, relation between bodies, let's call it that, yeah. Despite calls for childcare, despite many countries also enacting certain kinds of state interventions to try to encourage that to happen. And I guess also to wanting to honour women's desires to have children, it might not be the same as men's desires to have children, I don't know. Okay, but to open that up as a series of questions rather than closing it down. I want to have my cake and eat it, Are there any other questions or comments? Thank you. Um, it's probably a bit of a stupid question and because um, I know about speculative realism from the lectures here. I haven't read much. But every time I hear about the idea of things having a kind of uh, life of their own or of vitality. I keep thinking about a religious uh, perception of it and I keep thinking what's the relationship between speculative realism and religious practices or to be more specific, like the term in the text we read I think was the vitality of matter or matter vitality and sorry? Was it matter? Did they meet, read some other gene network? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah? Yeah, the relationship between the vitality of matter and animism, for example. Just, yeah. So you're concerned with the idea that that discourse might fall into a debate about the animation of matter by spirit, something like that? Um, I would more so hopeful than concerned. <laughs> okay. But, but I, I might be completely misunderstanding the whole thing. And I think, I'm trying to remember, there's a chapter in the Jane Goodall book where she tries to parse, if you like, to tries to make distinctions between a sort of um, pro-life set of arguments around vitality. So there is a kind of aspect of uh, 
this set of discussions that moves towards the idea that matter is lively because it's imbued with something called life, which then gets sort of sanctified, if you like, or becomes parts of debates about what it might mean to take life away from matter, or all debates around pro-life. And I think she tries quite hard to parse that set of discussions from. So, so for example, there's a difference between kind of vitalism as a movement that does have a kind of quasi-religious aspect to it, and the kind of vibrant matter argument that she wants to make through Spinoza, through Thoreau, through Deleuze and Guattari, through uh, Darwin, for example. So there is a sense of good and bad theories going on within there, but I think she does quite a good job of trying to unmuddle um, the histories of thinking around um, what might animate matter. She tries to basically say well, it, it's, it's no good necessarily reintroducing some kind of uh, quasi-human type of spirit within matter. And instead, I think she's interested more in uh, reclaiming some very, I think, natural processes, like entropy, for example, the, con the ways that matter is constantly in motion or on, on the move as a kind of, well, that's what is. It's not something that's imbued by a force from elsewhere. And I think there's quite a bit, those of you who do know Graham Harmon's work, that whole thing about undermining and overmining objects, and they're trying to notice the ways that these vitalist arguments can sometimes go back to thinking about one force. Yeah, one natural force, if you like, that then animates everything. And Harmon's particularly concerned not to engage with that kind of argument. So, you know, that, I suppose what I was trying to say before about showing that spectrum of realism pathfinder and just reminding ourselves there are lots of different, rather nuanced arguments within the field um, that sometimes get all bunched together in a sort of, uh, yeah, under some kind of umbrella term like spectrum of realism. And I think it probably is a little bit like, uh, you know, using the term postmodernism to bunch together a whole lot of different uh, perspectives that hold, are held together just simply by one kind of objection. Okay, so I think the vitalist arguments are probably a little bit different from Jane Bennett's kind of vibrant matter argument. Uh, I don't know if other people here might know the speculative realist work much better than I do, might want to respond differently to that. Does anyone want to own up to being a closet poem um, reader in philosophy? I just concerned about the like the relation between a child and the material. Then, like a child is with education is uh, can be became a different thing if in a different circumstance. But the material is. Usually the same thing in all places. Like, like the material of the objects is the same that going to other places. It don't have a reaction too much to the. It 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 it, 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 it remains the same thing. But the child when with the grow in the education part and then the other influence come more to the heart of the like the growing of the child and the result will depend on that on the different education system but then some materials are remain the same on other if, if you remove them to other places i think you know. do you think that's true are you saying that you do think there's a kind of maternal principle that holds for all cultures uh, yes i think that that the child that have taking things from the culture, but then I keep materials not taking too much from the culture. It stays extra life, that working on a child, but not on the... I don't know if I understood you correctly, but I, I didn't want to suggest in any way that there was a kind of universal set of maternal principles. I was working very much as at the level of the kind of material practice that is completely situated and culturally specific and located. Perhaps like, were you thinking that I was feeling an argument about 
um, some universal principles of, of maternal labor. Not just the uh, process of holding things, then that this object, when you move them to another place, if, like if it transferred from my father to me, the object that would be done, then this remains the same thing for me. But then the, if uh, a child will transform to me, it, the education, everything will become different. Then it's something else. And then that, when you take the human as an and the object, not just a. Uh, that this relation with the, uh, you know, the, when human is not the central of the. Okay. Well, it's just you, we do. Is it you and I have to chat now? Um, we'll release everyone else. Okay, because it sounds quite complicated. I'm not sure that I quite understood. So we can talk about it there. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I did put up the first chapter of Jane Bennett's book, Private Matter, on the video if you're interested. Uh, it's well worth reading. And those who are going to sum up, please read it. Yes. Uh, thank you all, and uh, we'll be in the pub as usual. And thanks very much to you.